Thanks for tuning in to Youth Group Radio, the greatest radio program of all history. It's so good that you can't even find Youth Group Radio on your radio. You're not going to find a podcast of it. You're not going to find it on Spotify. You're not going to find it on Pandora. It is so good that the only way you can listen to Youth Group Radio is on a platform specifically made only for videos. You heard that right. And we have been gathering up so many subscribers. There are listeners from all over the world. Antarctica, I want to shout out to you. Uh, North Korea, I want to shout out to you. Um, uh, Madagascar, I want to shout out to you. I just want to shout out to all of our fans all over the world. I cannot believe we have surpassed so many. I think we're probably on the top to being the most subscribed channel. We're probably on the top to being the most viewed channel and everything. And we're a radio station. That's crazy. Okay, but you know what, guys? The world is changing, and so we're going to change with it. But we're going to change one step ahead. Radio is now on video, but with no video, that would be ridiculous. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a great day. It's good to be here. Let's get right into it. Let's just go into it. I have no announcements. That's my announcement. Number one announcement, no announcements ever again. I'm sick of them. Let's just learn as we go. You know what I mean? But for real, hey, we're in John. Finally, we're back in John. Oh, snap. John part nine. And we're in John chapter four. And we have a doozy, a doozy doozy of a passage to read. It Listen, it's a lot of verses, and I know that's scary to you, but bear with me, okay? It's not that bad. It's actually, it tells a very simple story. So let's, let's open up our Bibles. Swish, swash. Where's, um, I'm, I'm reading from my pretend Bible. Oh, wait, no, I'm not. I have a real Bible right here. You hear that? That was, that was the Bible. That was the real Bible. It wasn't anything else. So, John chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read all the way to to verse 42. It's okay. Don't worry. Here we go. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the village that John, that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. About noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time, because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But, sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. She said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're great? You're, you, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It will become a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. 
Go get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you know what, you aren't even married to the, to, to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim that it is here out at, at Mount uh, Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Spirit in will will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, That's me. I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, What do you want to what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a food. I have a kind of food that you know nothing about. Did did someone bring him food while we were gone? His disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God, who sent me, and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe, already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvests. And it's true, I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village, so he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Oh man, let's pray. Jesus, you are so good and awesome. You are the Savior of the world. You are everything. Everything good comes from you, Lord, and you are light and you are hope in this world. We ask for the healing of the nations. We just ask right now that you would guide us in this time in spirit and in truth. And let this, let our hearts be taken captive by you and lead us into new life. It's in your name I ask this, Jesus. Amen. All right. All right. So, guys, think about this with me. If someone were to call you a Samaritan, how would you take it? You know? Like, if, if, if you heard someone say, um, hey, there goes Miss Williams. She's a real Samaritan. Like, what do they mean when they call her that? I mean, they they mean that she's someone like it's it, it, it's it's a compliment, right? They mean she's someone who lovingly serves people in need, and she expects nothing in return. It's it's a good thing. It's quite the compliment to be called a Samaritan these days. Um, in John chapter eight, Jesus is having a discussion with some people, and he's he's talking about what it really means to belong to God. And these, these Jews, they, they respond to Jesus' words in a fascinating way. Um, if you have your Bible on you, it's John chapter 8, uh, verse 48. Uh, look at what they say to Jesus in response. They say, You are a Samaritan and have a demon. I love how the New Living Translation puts it. It says that they say, You Samaritan devil. They call him a Samaritan devil. <laughs> I don't think they were um, complimenting Jesus when he called him when, when when they called him that. It seems like that was the worst thing they could think to call him. You're a Samaritan devil. Oh my goodness. 
If you call anyone that today, they're not going to think you're giving him a compliment. But it wasn't just the devil part that was, that was uh, you know, intense in that day. It was the Samaritan part. It's like calling them him, not only are you, are you a devil, but you're a dirty, impure devil. That's what they meant. In the first century world, a deep hatred and, pre- and prejudice existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. They both came from the same ancestors, uh, but the Jews claimed that the Samaritans were an unclean people because they had not kept their race, quote-unquote, pure, like the Jews supposedly did. And so the Jews claimed that the Samaritans were not true, true descendants of Abraham, which is funny because give the ending of, of John chapter 8 a read when you realize Jesus, a Jew, he was telling other Jews in chapter 8 that actually, hey, you guys are not true children of Abraham because it's not about who you're born to. And then they respond by calling him, you Samaritan devil, deep hatred, deep racism. To be called a Samaritan is the worst thing you could think of in this day and age, in that day and age. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, that's the story of the of the Good Samaritan that we all know, the man who, the Samaritan man who came to the aid of a Jew in desperate need when his own people ignored him. But here in John's Gospel, he tells of a story, it's not a story that Jesus tells, it's a story that Jesus is in. When Jesus had a world-changing conversation with a Samaritan woman. Jesus goes against all the rules in this conversation. First off, um, she's a woman, and no respectable Jewish man was ever to be alone with another woman who, who wasn't his wife or relative. Secondly, as already mentioned, she's a Samaritan, so that's a big no-no. Thirdly, she's not even a good person. <laughs> she has a terrible reputation. Like this is a woman of bad character. You know, it's it's all it's a triple whammy. It's three strikes you're out, Jesus. But that's the thing about Jesus. He's not afraid to go against cultural norms. He's not afraid to be associated with you. He's not afraid. <laughs> I love this. He's not afraid of you ruining his reputation. He's not afraid of me ruining his reputation. Rock and roll. So let's picture this. It's around noontime. Jesus is sitting by the well, and this woman approaches. The normal time for women to typically visit the well would be at a colder, a cooler time of day, most likely, you know, first thing in the morning or maybe early, early evening, This woman, she comes at a time when she's expecting no one else is going to be there. It's the hottest part of the day, and she's not going to see anyone who knows her and who knows of her past immoral lifestyle and her her present immoral lifestyle as well. The last thing this, this, this lady wants is to rub shoulders with the other women of the town who would love to gossip about her with each other, you know? And here's the thing, she doesn't know this yet, but Jesus knows all about her past. And he doesn't gossip about it at all. He just simply engages in a normal conversation with her. He just, he asks her for a drink. And she's, naturally, she is confused on why he wants a drink from her. But then Jesus tells her that, you know, it's actually, it's really uh, her who should be asking him for a drink. Since, you know, he has access to living water. Water so good that not only will it quench her thirst, that she will never thirst again because it will become a spring bubbling up inside of her, refreshing her with the new life which is coming into the world through Jesus. This woman at first thinks that Jesus is just talking about physical water, but she comes to learn that Jesus is talking of something deeper and something truer. In John chapter 7, Um, verses 37 through 39, Jesus says something very similar to a crowd, and um, John, the author, he he provides clarity to what Jesus is talking about. So John 7, verse 37 through 39 says this, on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me, 
Anyone who believes in me may come and drink, for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And then in verse 39, John provides some commentary. It says this verse in verse 39, John says, When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. The Samaritan woman doesn't quite get the full explanation here in chapter 4, but that's okay. It's enough for her. She doesn't know exactly what Jesus is talking about, but she wants to know more. But she's got to be careful here. We all must be careful. Because here's the thing, just just a little bit of curiosity in Jesus, it'll bring you dangerously close to God. You know, the closer you inch towards Jesus, the closer you inch toward light, true light, true, honest light. And this woman finds herself in the light as soon as she asks Jesus for his water. She says, yes, I need this water. She realizes that she needs Jesus in one way or another. And then Jesus says, go get your husband. Instantly, she comes face to face with her sin. That is the story of all of us. We realize that we need to follow Jesus. We realize that we need more of him. But then our sin is just staring us in the face, reminding us on why we haven't grown closer to Jesus, reminding us on why we can't grow closer to Jesus. The woman answered him when he said, go get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus loves her answer. He loves it. He goes, you can say that again. Fact is, you've had five husbands, and that guy you're with now isn't even one of them. You nailed it. It's like he's proud of her. He's just proud of her for her honesty. (laughs) it's, it's, It's as if her honesty is just refreshing to his soul as He's been surrounded by prideful religious folk who hide behind masks and condemn others in order to distract themselves from their own darknesses. And it's funny because all she said was that she doesn't have a husband. She didn't go into details, but Jesus loved that answer. He, he filled in the rest of the, of, of the gaps, you know? I, I love this because it means just a little bit of honesty with Jesus, it goes a long way. But then, so so how does she respond? Well, <laughs> she certainly doesn't want to talk about the, the details of what Jesus just said to her. Um, so she kind of, she, she kind of makes a, a distraction. She asks a religious question. And this is a classic ex- example of what happens when you start talking to people about Jesus. Um, you know, just, just go down the, the roads in your neighborhood, in our neighborhood, like just talk to people at school, start talking to them about Jesus, you know, and, and what do they start saying? Well, you know, we used to go to church, uh, we used to go to such and such church, but then my grandma wanted us to go with her, but then she, we didn't like the minister's wife, so we stopped going altogether. Or I hear some people say, yeah, uh, you know, we're, we're members of Walnut Valley. You know, we just haven't been there since the tornado, you know, since kind of before the tornado, but we, we, we just hadn't had time, but you know, but that's our church though. <laughs> or I'll hear something like, yeah, my mom was Catholic. My dad was Baptist. I did the whole church thing when I was younger. I got christened and I got baptized, so I'm good to go. It, it's always, it always kind of goes back to just, let's just talk about church. Let's just talk about church. And let me tell you why I'm not doing church. And here in John chapter 4, 2,000 years ago, you see the same tone of voice. You know, she says, yeah, I, you know, I was brought up to think that this mountain here in Samaria was God's holy mountain. But you Jews think that your mountain is the right one, you know? So translation, the implication of what she's saying is, you know, we really, we can't both be right. Maybe no one knows. Maybe nothing is certain. So maybe I shouldn't really worry about uh, about it, and I should just kind of keep doing my own thing. It's all excuses. Again, it's always like it's you start talking about God, you start talking about Jesus, and it's then people just start saying why they don't do church. 
here's the thing. God and church are not the same thing, but people will resort to that and fall back on that and say that's why that's why they really don't really do the God thing. Um, they just ta- start talking about church. But it's all excuses. It's all irrelevant. What do you, what do you think about Jesus? Yeah, well, my grandma hates the pastor, so listen, that's not relevant. What do you think about Jesus? Yeah, so like what, what mountain is even the right one? That's not relevant, Miss Samaritan. Forget about the church drama. Forget about which mountain is the right one. We're missing the point. Jesus says, it's not going to matter where you worship. It's not going to matter where you worship. But instead, it's how you worship. I mean, I, I would say, first and foremost, it's who you worship. But he's talking about here, he's saying it's how you worship. He says, we will worship the who, the Father, how in spirit and in truth. But this is not a code. You know, we think of how to worship, and our minds go to uh, styles, worship styles, which is the last thing that Jesus will ever care about. Jesus doesn't care about style. He just tells us to worship in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? To worship God in spirit, first and foremost, is to worship God. For God is spirit, Jesus says in verse 24. The Holy Spirit is is God. So we worship him in spirit, and we worship him in his truth, which his truth is truth. Some people only focus on the truth. Think of it this way. They only focus on the, I'm going to worship him in truth. And so they read lots of their Bible, and they, they contain, they trap God to just the holy book, saying that this book is all that God is and all that God ever will be. Nothing more. Other people just treat God like a feeling. They're kind of more, they only do the worshiping in spirit. So they just kind of treat God like a feeling. And they will say things about God that just kind of feel right in the moment. Like, it feels right, this is who God is. Yeah, okay, I'm going to go with that. See, they're not containing God. They're not trapping God in, in a book like the others. Instead, they are containing God to their personal preferences. Okay? We need to see the truth of who God is. It's, re- it's revealed to us in Scripture, but we also need to pray for the Holy Spirit to give us understanding of that Scripture and to realize that God is... is is beyond that, 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 that God is alive. He is not just an idea. He, he is not just something to theorize about. He is the living God. So we need to pray that, that the Holy Spirit gives us understanding of the Scripture and to give us understanding of how to live the new life of Jesus, this new life that Jesus has given us in the world here and now. All of this is just too much for the Samaritan woman. So she tries to make another kind of distraction, another religious excuse. So she says, well, you know, maybe one day the Messiah will come. So why don't we just wait till then? He'll make it all clear. We don't really need to worry about all of this. But Jesus says, that's me. I'm the Messiah. This is so cool. He tells her that he's the Messiah before he tells anyone else, before he tells any of his disciples or anyone, he tells the Samaritan woman that he is the one she was hoping for. Whenever people say things like, if only someone would come and sort out this mess in my life, there he is. Hear Jesus say, hey, that's me. He's just waiting to do what he does best. You know, restoring brokenness, breathing new life into a dead situation. The disciples then finally come onto the scene, and they're terrified. They're terrified to see their leader talking with a Samaritan woman, but none of them spoke up. They're probably afraid because they're like, listen, this seems wrong, but if I say anything, I know he's going to show me how I'm. my way of thinking is definitely incorrect. <laughs> so they just kind of stay silent. The Samaritan woman, she finally lets the walls around her heart fall and crumble down. No more excuses. She is thrilled. 
she realizes that she is known by God and that God has not at all forgotten her. So she runs back into town and starts telling everyone about Jesus. Jesus' disciples then try to get Jesus to eat something, but Jesus is not hungry at all. Uh, He is so satisfied in this moment. He's so satisfied that he says, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. And then he says in verse 34 that his nourishment comes from doing the will of God. And as he looks at this Samaritan woman, he knows that this is exactly why his father sent him to earth. Now, does the Samaritan woman have the perfect theology? Is her understanding of Jesus perfectly sound? (laughs) No, she seems to regard Jesus as a cross between a fortune teller and the Messiah. But she knows it's from God, and she's telling everyone about it. And Jesus is satisfied. He looks at her, and he is full of joy. He turns to his disciples, and he says, you you see this? The fields are already ripe for harvest. He says, what joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? He's saying, guys, look at the world around you. Look at the people. People are ready to see hope. They're ready to see light. People are ready to be restored from the brokenness. The world is ready to be reconciled back to God. Go out there and bring hope to the nations, not just your nation, but even even the nations that you thought were your enemies. It's time to show them the light of Jesus. Here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus is not a statement. Jesus is not a doctrine. Jesus is not a formula. Jesus is not a feeling. Jesus, hear me out on this, Jesus is not a political mascot. We use him as a political mascot all the time to to prove our political views. He is not your mascot. He is Lord. He is King of Kings. Showing people the light of Jesus means letting Jesus shape the very way you see others. The way you even think. Letting him shape the way you think so that our lives would be defined by who Jesus is, not by who we want him to be. He's not our mascot. We worship him in spirit and in truth, humble, like a child, ready to let Jesus teach you how to breathe. Let's read the last paragraph of our passage in John 4, starting in verse 39. Let's, let's, let's hear it or read it one more time. It says, Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed two days. I love that. Long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. That last paragraph is truly worth pondering and meditating over deeply by yourself. Here is a woman who just, you know, an hour or so before had been completely trapped in a life of immorality. She was defined by her sins. She was a social outcast. There was no way backwards or forwards for her. She she was just stuck, just left to exist and try to, living a life where she's trying to just avoid any social encounters. And now she has become the first evangelist to the Samaritan people. Before any of Jesus' own followers could do it, she told them that he was the Messiah. But... Did she tell them that he was the Messiah? What did they call him at the end? The, the people of some uh, of the the Samaritan people say he really is the one. He's the savior of the world. Whoa! So here's the thing: the Messiah was supposed to be the savior of Israel. Savior of the world and Messiah are supposed to be two different things. But the Samaritan people have made them one and the same. Throughout the Gospel of John, John frequently shows us how people misunderstand what Jesus is saying 
Like whenever Jesus says, I have food that you don't understand. And they're like, oh, did, did someone get him bread or something? All the time, Jesus is saying stuff and people don't understand. But then every now and then, John will show us uh, like an unexpected breakthrough with someone where someone understands what Jesus is saying far more than they ever should have. The Samaritans got it. They got it before anyone else. They understood Jesus is the savior of the world. How incredible is that? This woman went from having a life of shame to having a life defined by hope. Jesus didn't correct the woman whenever she went out and shared. She probably didn't say the perfect phrases, you know? But Jesus didn't say, yeah, she's, she's kind of right. You know, let me, let, let me kind of fix your, your doctrine. Let me fix your theology a bit. You know, also, also, she needs to make sure that she stops doing, you know, this, this, and this, because we all know about her sin history. So she's going to have to go through rehab for a while. No, Jesus is just, he, he's just satisfied with her discovering who Jesus is. <laughs> and it's the beginning of a whole new life for her. She has the spring. She has the spring bubbling up inside of her, the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't give up on her. And he certainly hasn't given up on you, on us. I could say, so so now we just need to go out there and share our testimonies. But, yeah. But do do you even have one to share? You're like, oh yeah, I, I know my testimony. I got saved when I was when I was, you know, two years old or something. Um, I don't know how old you were. I was like almost eight years old. Is that where, is that what I'm going to share? Is oh, I got saved when I was eight. I mean, that's good to share. Or maybe you got saved when you were older, but it was years ago. This here's the thing. Think about this. This woman didn't just go up and share something that happened to her years and years ago. She went out and told people what Jesus was doing. Just minutes ago, just minutes ago, draw near to Jesus. Let him teach you again, just as he taught this woman. Here's the thing. He loves your honesty. What if, what if you were just honest with Jesus? He loves your honesty, and he's proud of you. He actually is. Now, a huge problem is that we think we have to drown ourselves in guilt. You know what I mean? Like, we are driven by guilt, are we not? Like, it's all about guilt. We follow God because we feel guilty. We're like, oh, I'm so guilty, and he's going to kill me, so i got to follow God. Or, or whenever, once we do follow God, we put faith in Jesus, then we find ourselves still drowning in guilt. And so we start saying things like, like, oh, yeah, I really should start reading my Bible more. Guilt. Guilt makes you say that. Oh, I really should do this one. I know I really should. Guilt, guilt, guilt. And you know what that guilt does for you? Nothing. Guilt cripples us. Here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus took on all of your guilt, all of your shame on the cross. That guilt is powerless. That guilt is dead. Jesus did not come so your life would be driven and defined by guilt. He's come to set you free. Did Jesus guilt the woman? No. I mean, look at Jesus. He is so happy that she's just honest about her brokenness. Like, what? He came to stink and save us. He didn't come to guilt us, but to free us from our guilt so that we can finally be who we were always meant to be. He cares. He cares and loves you. If Jesus believed in the Samaritan woman, he believes in you. Bring your excuses to Jesus, meet with him again, and find new life. God has not forgotten you, and he's not disappointed in you. Sorry, I know you wish he was, but he's not. He knows you at your worst. (laughs) It wasn't a guilt trip that changed the Samaritan woman's life. It wasn't a lecture that changed her life. It was just talking with Jesus. So, hey, talk to him. Talk to Jesus. You can't go wrong. Read this passage again. (laughs) Rediscover who God is. Look to Jesus. 
Read this passage again. Pray through it. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand. And ask the Holy Spirit to guide you right here and right now, wherever you find yourself at in life. All right, guys, I love you. Jesus loves you even more. Youth Group Radio, keep it funky fresh forever. Don't look back, nothing left to see.